and we would like to welcome you to the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. This is a wonderful day today and I'm delighted uh, to be with you. My name is Yvonne Lewis and I am your moderator for today on behalf of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, which is a, a partnership of a community and academic uh, partners to bring to you the best information that we absolutely can with a variety of other partners within our community. Uh, this is week 34. Can you imagine 34 weeks from March 20th and we are here today and this is a day of celebration. I was sharing earlier that today uh, in this week we have seen our community members and the residents across this nation stand up and let their voices be heard. Regardless to whichever side you took, you chose, you did your duty as an American citizen to speak your voice. And on behalf of our team, we want to thank you because we spent several weeks saying to you, uh, from get out to uh, vote, to fill out your census, and we're excited to say today that our communities have shown up in rare form and been a part of this process. And this does not end here, it continues. So we want you to stay tuned. We have a wonderful a program outline, a session outline for you today. A lot of great information. So get ready, uh, as uh, it, if Arlsman heard, get ready, get ready. We're gonna get started right in today with hearing from the city of Flint. We're excited today to have Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, who is the chief advisor, chief health advisor for the city of Flint to give us updates uh, from the city of Flint. All right, Dr. I'll Reynolds, start good off. Good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, friends, neighbors, and even some enemies. Get your flu shot, <laughs> please. Okay, then I'll say get tested. If you've never been tested, get tested. If you feel sick, get tested. If you've taken care of someone who's sick, get tested. Uh, if you leave the home, get tested. You must get tested so we have an idea of what the status of the community is, but also what your personal status is. And just remember, a result for one day that's negative does not mean you're negative forever. And our other speakers will go into more detail, but forget everything else I just said and get tested. Okay, then we have had almost 1700 uh, COVID cases in the past 14 days in the period 1022 to 11 4. 1700. So here's another tip have your home care kit available, get a thermometer. Get some Tylenol or whatever you take for fever. Have some masks, soap for hand washing. Know your health insurance, your doctor, the provider's phone number and what hospital your doctor uses. Get your medications refilled so that you are prepared should you have an illness in your household and you don't know what to do next. And if you don't know who your health insurer is, talk to the folks at Genesee Health Plan. But these are things we must do because we are having community spread. Uh, we're not having super spreader events as such, but community spread uh, where people have no recall of contacts is what's getting us now. And don't think you can run to the country and you'll escape COVID because it's there too. We are in the highest risk category uh, for the Michigan My Start plan, which means things are not good. Before you go to a crowd, have a plan. If you get there and it doesn't look right, people aren't wearing masks, there's too many people, the air circulation is, is not good, think again. And when we go shopping now, we let our guard down, but now you better think about it. When you go grocery shopping, you do not have to take Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. If you need someone to help you, take one person. But for the protection of your household, everybody does not need to go out. Uh, so I will cut it short at that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. As and always, you've kind of framed our session for us. So for our listeners today, we are going to be talking about the flu vaccines. We are going to be talking about getting tested. And we are going to be talking about, again, what we need to do to be prepared in this environment to ensure that we have the appropriate health care coverage. But we still in the city of Flint have some concerns that we've been wrestling with for several years now. And Billy Mitchell, who is our public health manager, is going to actually give us some insights on just, just the reminders and updates on what we need to do with respect to the water issues in our community. So Billy, please help us. Mm -hmm. good. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And so, um, like Yvonne was saying, if you still have not had pipes replaced, you have until November 19th to get that done. All you have to do is go on our, go on our website at www.cityofflint.com or you can call me, Billy Mitchell, 810-237-2044. You can also call Ro if you have any questions at 810-410-1133. Um, when you do your opt-in form online or you can come down to Flint City Hall, um, 1101 South Saginaw Street, downtown Flint, you can come to our information counter. There will be the form there for you to fill out. It takes literally one minute. You can give it right to the um, attendant at the desk and then it'll get to me and I'll take it down to a row for you. Um, also, if you still need your water restored for free, no charge, no fee, do not get it confused with new water service, but water restoration, you can call 810-410-2020. Again, it's 810-410-2020. Um, the City of Flint also at the information counter down at City Hall has water filters, water test kits, masks, and recycling bags for residents. You can request those from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday is the time that our customer service department slash water department is open. So if you want to bring your cash payments to City Hall to either pay your water bill or to pay your property taxes, you can do that in person. The mayor uh, made that time frame for residents who prefer to pay with cash because it was a request from residents. You can also come down to Flint City Hall and drop your um, payments in the red drop box in front of City Hall, outside, right by the door, if you would prefer to do it that way. Um, so I am still taking your opt-in forms again until the 19th of November, and you can still come down here and make your water payments nine to one, Monday through Friday. Thank you, Billy, so much. And I know sometimes people say, well, why do we continue to share this? Because every week we find out somebody else new needs this information. So you that are listening, please help us get this information out to others in our community that still might not be quite aware that this is available. Again, we want you to know that we're listening to you and we hear the questions that you're bringing in. Thank you for sending in questions to the HFRCC, info HFRCC info at hfrcc.org or you can remember to call us at 810-835-2130 for additional questions. We get a lot of questions about what the state is doing. So Gary Jones, who is the representative from the governor's office for the city of Flint, is here with us this afternoon to give us the special updates from the governor's office. Welcome, Gary. <laughs> This, this picture always cracks me up because it's been so long ago. <laughs> but uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So total confirmed cases of COVID-19 statewide are now at 197,806. A total COVID-19 deaths are 7,470. And total of recovered COVID-19 cases as of October 30th are 121,093. And as a reminder to everyone, recovered is defined as the number of persons with a confirmed COVID-19 diagnosis who are alive 30 days post onset. Uh, so recently, uh, the governor asked for a statewide uh, mass law. Uh, she wrote a letter uh, to Michigan lawmakers uh, to enact a statewide law on mask wearing as the state continues to see coronavirus case records and hospital admissions uh, steadily rise. Uh, the governor was quoted saying, we've known for a long time that the single most important weapon we have against this virus is the simple act of wearing a mask. Uh, wearing a mask protects our families, it protects ourselves, and it also protects our frontline workers and our most vulnerable members of our society. Uh, also, Michigan is on track to reach uh, our flu vaccine goal with 2.4 million vaccinations 
Uh, so nearly 2.4 million Michiganders have gotten their flu vaccine this season, putting the state more than halfway towards its goal of 4.2 million vaccinations, uh, according to uh, MDHHS. Uh, the flu vaccine is available across the state, and residents can find a location nearby at michigan.gov backslash flu. Uh, also recently, the governor signed a couple of bills into law. Uh, so the governor signed the following bills um, into law that are among the legislature's new coronavirus legislation. House Bill 6137 requires the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs to publish publicly on the DHHHS website certain data regarding COVID-19 in nursing homes. The bill requires updates from DHHS on its website weekly regarding certain COVID-19 metrics and visitation policies. Uh, also, House Bill 6293 codifies in law certain expanded COVID-19 testing services that Governor Whitmer provided uh, through executive orders. So this bill allows certain volunteers and workers to help with the COVID-19 testing process under the proper supervision of qualified licensees or local health departments until June 30th, 2021. Uh, the governor was quoted in regards to the legislation that right now uh, Michigan is seeing a record number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalization and these bills will help us protect each other as we continue to fight the virus. COVID-19 is still a very real threat um, and she's going to make sure that um, she continues to do everything in her power to save lives and will work with anyone who shares those goals. And as always, um, michigan.gov backslash coronavirus, still the best website to keep up with all updates. Thank you, Gary. And this, this, this is important that there's some, some connection between all the things that we're talking about at our local level and the state level. So this support is very, very important. We appreciate those updates. Just want to remind our listeners again, if you have questions today, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A. If you have that on your screen, or again, give us a, give us a call at 810- 835-2130, and we will be happy to answer those questions. But we look forward to hearing from you today. As a matter of fact, we did get some questions from last week's session that we want to follow up on today in the early part of our session because Jim Melanowski from the Gen C Health Plan provided for us some insights about uh, Medicaid open enrollment. And the question mm -hmm. came, Jim, what's the difference between Medicaid, Medicare, and these open enrollment periods? So we thought we'd bring you back to Today, so you can give us some added additional insights. So, Jim, please help us out with this. Uh, good afternoon, Yvonne. How are you? Good afternoon. Great. I, I probably was so confusing last time that that's why you got all those questions. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if there are some slides that uh, we can show. Um, yes, we've, we've, we've got the slide yeah, that so just it, talks about open enrollment again. Yeah, and then, so, Medicare open enrollment. They, these are for uh, people who are applying for Medicare supplemental plans and Plan D. We, when you have Medicare, you have Plan A and Plan B, one for hospitalization, one for seeing your doctor and, your, and, uh, and getting ba the basic care. And then normally people have to get a Plan D for prescriptions and then other plans that they want to add on things like dental and vision and and other, um, and, and sometimes it brings some costs down if you get these supplemental plans. Open enrollment has started and it will end December 7th in, for those uh, during that open enrollment period. So it's really important to have what medications you need uh, and you're taking and your Medicare card, your, 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 your no Medicare ID number, so that you can, uh, whoever you're working with, whether it's a Genesee Health Plan member, enrollment staff, or one of our partners like the Health Coalition or Hamilton, those folks can help you really process this and find out what is the best plan, but you have to do that before December 7th. Then, uh, uh, then there's other, then there's this whole Obamacare. Uh, that is for people who choose uh, a plan underneath that health insurance marketplace or Obamacare. And that enrollment started on uh, November 1st and will end December 15th. So that's a little, that's like one more extra week than Medicare. That's a little confusing. You'd think they, they would have the same deadline, but that's not how right. our, our government works, does it? So, right. um, uh, but this is for folks who uh, would uh, qualify under, uh, 
uh, the um, Affordable Care Act and, and can purchase those uh, health insurance plans. For many people, it's just a re-enrollment. Uh, uh, people that uh, last year signed up and then they have to re every, like every year re-enroll. And so they probably got a notice. Sometimes they don't, they got a notice from their insurance plan that they don't have to do anything. They're just gonna auto renew unless they do something or they might have to go on and pick a different plan or they might have looked at it this year and said, you know what, I need uh, this type of coverage or these medications weren't covered by my plan. I need these. So that's why working with a, a place that will help you with enrollment like Genesee Health Plan, like the Health Coalition, like Hamilton and our other partners is so important. But you have to December 15th to do that. So Jim, right, right where you're at that point, some people when they, you know, during this era of COVID, many people lost their jobs and they found out that they were eligible for a, one of these other programs like Health Alliance Plan or Total Health Care. And they, they were automatically, in some cases, people automatically assigned. If they did not really like the provider or like that coverage that they had, this is the time for them to make that change. Well, yeah, that if they were under the Affordable Care Act, most of the people who lost their job because of COVID during during that time had the opportunity to enroll in what we call Healthy Michigan or Medicaid. That's different. So we had right. Medicare, we had Obamacare, and then Medicaid. And Medicaid is something that yes, you can change your plan. You can contact. Uh, um, it's called Michigan Enrolls and, and do that. Uh, you'll, you, you should have gotten information. That's another thing where every year you have to re-enroll and that's based on your enrollment date. So I would suggest if people get something from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, they open that up of the letter. It's usually a letter and saying, hey, we need to hear from you again to see if you qualify. Usually after one year, um, and uh, it'll be, you know, in, in, in the spring for a lot of those people in the summer, those people who lost their jobs, but really three separate categories and Medicare, December 7th, Obamacare, December 15th, Medicaid is ongoing or open during this time. But yes, you need to contact, if you're looking to switch doctors, switch plans, you, uh, you need to contact your insurance carrier. Thank you. And, and Jim, because there's, a, there's so many things for people to think about, we want to make sure that they understand the health plan is a place to go to get this assistance. So we provided this information. If you could just kind of give us a, just that closing statement there. Yeah. So call 810-232-7740. And we have staff that can answer these specific questions kind of see what's the best plan and uh, that's open right now for you and then we can help you walk through the application process and remember there is no cost to help people enroll into health care if if you get contacted or they're going to say hey you need to pay us a certain amount of money to get enrolled into health care it's a scam run away from it thank you jim I, we really wanted to make sure that we emphasize this again today because it was were questions that came up. Not that you didn't explain it, but oh, it's, it's, it's always these little details that sometimes we miss in these conversations. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. So as we're talking about having health coverage, because we do encourage people to, ins to make sure that you have coverage, you understand it, and you use it. We're, we're going to continue the conversation with the health department now, and we spend the bulk of our uh, session today on this issue, we've got some questions in the queue about this, and I think if you if you keep listening, you're going to hear some of these answers today. So we're happy to have Kim Van Slyte with us, along with Susan Cooper. But we're going to begin with Kim Van Slyte Smith, who is the Nursing Services Director of the Genesee County Health Department. We received numerous questions this week about quarantine, isolation, the test, and contact tracing. Help us, Kim. There's so many questions out there. Good afternoon, Yvonne. It's great to be back. So new topic for me this week. Um, we are going to talk about quarantine versus isolation and then a little bit about testing as well. So 
quarantine in general, and again, this is not anything that's new to COVID. These are terms and conditions that have um, been around for years and apply to all communicable infectious diseases. So quarantine, what is quarantine? It separates you from and restricts movement. Um, sorry, I've got to adjust my screen because my my faces are over all of my words. Anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it separates and restricts movement of people who have been exposed to a contagious disease such as COVID um, to see and observe if they develop symptoms and are gonna become sick. Um, a good way to remember this is quarantine the questionable. So Q and Q, quarantine the questionable. And what is isolation? Isolation separates people who are actually sick with a contagious or infectious disease, such as COVID, from people who are not sick. And again, isolate the ill, eye for eye. So two good ways to remember that. Go ahead and, and advance my screen there. Okay, so quarantine specifically, um, it, you quarantine, separate, again, restrict the movements of people who are exposed to contagious or infectious disease, Quarantine period is always determined um, based on the amount of time a disease takes to um, incubate. Um, every single disease is different. And we've, at, at the beginning, it took a while for us to know what the incubation period was because this was a new disease. Um, they've done lots of research and we now know that some people start uh, developing symptoms within two days and some people it takes all the way up to four days and it can be anywhere in between. So that's how they determined that 14 day quarantine period. Um, Whoops, back up just for a minute there. <laughs> Incubation period, because um, I mentioned that, is uh, time between being exposed to a disease and when the symptoms actually start to manifest. So you're being quarantined during the incubation period of the disease to see if it's going to develop and take hold in your system. Um, and again, the COVID-19 quarantine period is 14 days after your last contact with a person who has been identified as having COVID. Okay, isolation, again, separates sick people who have a contagious disease or an infectious disease from people who are not sick to help protect them. The isolation period is also determined based on the specific disease um, and the time in which it can be infectious or contagious and be transmitted to others. The COVID-19 isolation period that has been determined is 10 days if you're an otherwise healthy individual. So your home, you might have um, um, comorbidities, you might have high blood pressure, you might have diabetes, but if you're well maintained and you were in pretty good um, health with your medication before you got sick, then um, and you didn't need to be hospitalized, then you're considered an other, otherwise healthy individual and you're isolated for 10 days. Um, if you're immunocompromised, if like severely immunocompromised, like uncontrolled diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis or all of our um, immuno um, diseases, or if you're critically ill, if you've been hospitalized, spent a lot of time in the hospital, um, been in the intensive care, then your recovery, the isolation period is 20 days because that virus can live on in your system because your immune system is not functioning at its top level. Okay, next slide. So again, just to reiterate, quarantine the questionable, those who have been exposed and may still become symptomatic and infectious, isolate the ill, those who are already exhibiting symptoms or have tested positive without symptoms, because we hear a lot about that, right, Yvonne? We hear a lot about those people who are positive but asymptomatic. Yes, so, we do. If they're, if they're positive and without symptoms, we still wanna isolate them. So big questions that we hear all the time, how do I get out of, how do I get out of quarantine? How do, I, how do I go back to work? How do I go back to school? So not a whole lot of quest, uh, options here. You either complete the 14 day quarantine period or you become symptomatic and you have COVID and then you begin your isolation period. There is no testing out of quarantine ever. If you're in quarantine, you cannot 
come out of quarantine just because you receive a negative test, no matter what kind of test it is. And we'll talk about those in a minute. So right, right there, right quickly, yep. right there. So even if a person doesn't get a doctor to tell them they should go into quarantine, based upon their it, what it was shared with them, they should go into quarantine. Yes, absolutely. If you tested positive for COVID-19, um, or I'm sorry, if you were exposed to someone who tested positive to COVID-19 and somebody told you that, maybe the health department didn't call you, maybe the doctor didn't call you, maybe just your best friend called and said, hey, I just got my test results back and they're positive, that means you should be in quarantine and you are quarantined from life. You should stay home in your house and only go out of the house for medical services. You should have your groceries delivered or pick them up at the curbside. You should not be in close contact with any individuals. Um, and so the quarantining, everyone's immune, is, immune system is um, a little different and the specific amount of virus that they're exposed to is also different and that makes a difference in how quickly you develop symptoms. It makes a difference in how severe your um, coronavirus is if you were to get it. Um, so that's why we have to wait that whole 14 days because some people, you know, their immune system, they might be already fighting off a cold and they get exposed to COVID. And so they might come down with symptoms much faster than somebody whose immune system was top notch 100% and not stressed at that point in time. Uh, most people will have to complete the whole 14 days of quarantine. No questions asked. And we, we count in days, we calendar days, we get a lot of questions about, well, I was exposed at noon on this day. Does that mean I get to come out of the quarantine at noon on this day? It's just by the calendar. If you were quarantined until today, you're quarantined until the end of the day and you can resume whatever your normal daily life is tomorrow. Um, there are a couple of instances where you might be allowed out of quarantine, but you would not be testing out of quarantine. You may initially be placed in quarantine while we're doing the investigation or while your workplace or your school is during the, doing the investigation. Um, and then during the investigation, we may figure out, no, you really weren't a close contact. You can go back to your daily life. You do not need to quarantine. So that causes some confusion because people are told they're in quarantine or they hear others are in quarantine and then the next day they see them out and about out of quarantine. So that potentially could happen. The other thing is that you could be placed in quarantine because you're a close contact of a person who was placed in isolation as a probable case. So there's a whole bunch of definitions for terminology that the CDC puts out. Probable, the most common type of probable case is somebody who has been exposed to a lab confirmed um, COVID person and has started to develop symptoms themselves. So the chances are that they are COVID positive. And then you were exposed to them, you need to quarantine. If they then go to the doctor and get their test and get a diagnosis and, oh, nope, they didn't have COVID, they had strep throat, then you would be able to be removed from quarantine. But you are not testing out of quarantine because, again, there is no testing out of quarantine. How do you get out of isolation? Again, if you meet the criteria and you complete your isolation, you will be removed and allowed to go back to work. How do you complete that isolation? It has to have been at least 10 days since the onset of symptoms and your symptoms have to be resolving and you have to have been fever free for at least 24 hours without any medication like Tylenol or ibuprofen that, that could potentially mask or reduce your fever. If you were isolated because you were symptomatic and you were sent home because you had COVID-like symptoms, then you could be removed from isolation because your medical provider has, has identified or given you an alternative diagnosis like strep throat and you have tested negative for COVID-19. So in the beginning, they were going to the doctor and if you tested positive for strep, you were clear, didn't have to worry about it didn't have to worry about COVID. We have seen 
co-infections. So we are, um, they are encouraging um, physicians and medical pro professionals now to test and rule out COVID, even if they've found another infection. So um, on to COVID testing, there are three basic groups of testing, serology or antibody testing, which is always a blood test, antigen, um, rapid antigen testing, which is usually a nose swab, and then PCR or molecular testing, which is a laboratory confirmed test. And this is the one that um, we really, really push for. The other tests are great. Um, they have their purpose. Um, they're good screening, good um, beginning diagnostics, um, but we really, um, we really push for that PCR um, as a confirmatory once we've um, done the others. So go ahead and, and next a little bit about the serology or antibody. Um, they might pick your finger. If they're doing other blood work, they might draw your blood. Um, it can be a rapid test. It can be sent to the lab. Um, so if it's a rapid test, you might get the results back in 15 minutes while you're sitting in the urgent care. Um, if it's a lab, it'll take a day or so for you to get the results back. Um, a positive antibody test tells you that you have antibodies in your system that uh, are from an infection um, of the, that causes COVID-19. This is the test that people are, were saying, well, that's not a good test. Um, it'll pick up even regular coronavirus like the cold. And yes, this is the test that could potentially pick up antibodies from other types of coronavirus. Um, but they do um, definitely pick up COVID-19 as well. Um, antibody tests cannot diagnose COVID. Um, it will not show you yes or no definitively that you have the virus right now. So it's not used to diagnose you with COVID. Um, an antigen or rapid antigen test is usually done with a nasal swab. It can be done with a, a throat swab. Um, this also cannot positively rule out active coronavirus infection. Um, they are more likely to miss an active coronavirus infection, so their um, um, false negatives and false positives um, uh, do happen with these. Um, and again, the PCR or molecular tests are more um, reliable. If you have a negative antigen test, especially if you're having symptoms or you know that you were exposed for a long period of time to somebody who has COVID-19, then you should um, request or your healthcare provider may suggest that they do a molecular test, such as a PCR test. This PCR is, we consider a lab confirmed test. It is usually done um, with a nasal swab, that's the one that first came out, that nasal pharyngeal swab that uh, everybody tells you they're going to tickle your brain. It can also be done with a throat swab, similar to what they do for strep throat. And now, like our community testing sites, um, it can be done with a saliva test. You usually get the results in one to three days. Um, they have recently come out with a rapid PCR test, um, and um, so then you would get your results right away. And this is the most accurate diagnosis active COVID infection test. So if you have a molecular test um, and it's positive, um, you, it is very reliable. Um, so this table I just included, it basically says everything that I have said in this presentation. It just puts it all into one table. Um, molecular testing, antigen testing, antibody testing. How do they take the sample? How long does it take to get results? is another test needed, what it shows, and what it can't do. The most important line in this, I think, is what it can't do. So a molecular test, if show if you ever had COVID or were infected with the coronavirus in the past, the molecular test won't tell you that. An antigen test um, cannot definitively rule out active coronavirus. So it can't tell you if you have coronavirus right now. It can tell you if you maybe had it in the past. Um, and an antibody test cannot diagnose active coronavirus. Again, um, it can only um, show that maybe you had it in the past. So there you go. Questions about all of that whole <laughs> basket of information. Right. You say, there you go. So I just want to, before you leave, Kim, I do have a question.
quick question, but I do want to remind our, our listeners, if you've joined us by YouTube, you, uh, uh, thank you, but we want our listeners who are in the webinar right now, these are being taped, so you can go back and review it because this is great information. And I know even if you were taking notes, you might have missed a few. But one of the things, Kim, if you could talk to us, if a person has been exposed or they were told they were exposed to somebody who was exposed and they get the rapid test, do they need to repeat one of the other tests like the PCR that we have at the testing sites within a few days of that rapid test or should they be like, I'm okay? So if you've been exposed, um, it is recommended that you wait at least five days before you get tested. And seven to 10 days is a better recommendation. Um, just like it takes a few days for your body to build up enough virus to start having symptoms, it takes a few days for your body to build up enough virus for you to test positive. Um, just like a pregnancy test. If you are, you could be pregnant. Um, you're not gonna. Sh your body's not gonna produce enough of that hormone to show up in the test until you're at least two weeks pregnant. So it's similar to that type of a situation. Your body has to build up the virus in order for it to be detected. Um, that's gonna take a minimum of five days, usually seven to ten days, for it really to be accurate. If you get if you're in quarantine, you've been exposed, and you get a negative rapid test and you're having symptoms, that's that piece where you should push to have the PCR or molecular lab confirmed testing done. Um, if you're not having symptoms um, and the rapid is negative, it's pretty accurate. Okay, all of them are pretty accurate or they wouldn't be on the market. Okay, some are just more accurate than others. So um, again, you had a negative rapid test. That doesn't mean that you can come out of quarantine, but it means that you can breathe a little easier. You should continue to monitor your symptoms. If you start to develop symptoms, say you got tested on day seven, you get another seven days of quarantine. If you start developing symptoms on day nine or 10, go back and get another test because maybe it's taken that long for your body to build up enough and an, enough of the virus to be detected. So you don't, you aren't off the hook. You don't get to leave the house and be out of quarantine, but you can breathe a little easier. We don't get a, a get out of quarantine no. pass. No. Well, thank, thank you, Kim. This is a lot of information. And I recognize that it's challenging because we're working. We got children that are in school. We have a lot of things going on. And to say you've got to stay in quarantine for that number of days does often get challenging for us. But we want you to pay attention to these things because it is necessary for us to ensure our overall health personally for our families and for our communities. So thank you, Kim, for these insights. Now, as you've given us these insights, uh, Suzanne Cooper is gonna give us some updates from the overall perspective of the health department and talk about our testing sites. Good afternoon, Suzanne. Okay, I know a little bit earlier, we had a little bit of a challenge with- Hi, everyone. Go. Okay, it's there Suzanne. you go. As of yesterday, we posted to our website 6,906 positive COVID-19 test results with 320 deaths. We have a positivity rate of 9.1. So again, it is critically important that you know about the testing site, you know where you can get tested in our community. We talked about PCR testing. All of the testing that is done at all of these sites is PCR testing. And again, you've got the slide of a test at Word of Life, Bethel United Methodist Church, and Macedonia Baptist Church. So for those particular tests, you're going to go and 30 minutes before you get tested, you should not drink, eat, chew gum or use tobacco products that will interfere with the test. But all three of these sites do take reservations or if you will, an appointment, but you can go and show up and they will help you. These are also locations where adults and children are tested. 
If anyone has a bear, be it a disability, English as a second language, deaf of hard of hearing, all individuals will be accommodated so you can go to those locations and you can be tested. We have additional locations in our community where you can be tested. The newest of those locations is the Walgreens on Davison Road in Flint. And we still have the two Rite Aid locations, one in Swartz Creek and one in Flint. And again, these are the nasal swabs or the nasal pharyngeal swabs, depending upon which location you go to. Hamilton is still offering their testing at their North Point Clinic and at the fire station in Burton on the corner of Bristol and South Saginaw. So all of these locations are available. You've heard Dr. Reynolds say many, many times, it's not a one and done. Again, you will have to get tested. You'll want to get tested periodically. So these locations are there to accommodate those needs. Don't hesitate to reach out to them, make an appointment, you can show up and they will take good care of you. So I'm going to repeat what Dr. Reynolds said earlier, uh, just this is the time of year to get your flu shot. If you haven't gotten one already, please do so. Again, we are having two respiratory related illnesses in the same time frame, influenza and COVID-19. So do your part to protect yourself um, from the flu virus. Make sure you get your flu shot. This is also the time for you and your family and friends to plan ahead for how you're going to handle the holidays. So have that conversation. If you need additional information, you can visit our website, www.gchd.us. Uh, get some information about things to think about as you're planning for your holidays. Again, remember our numbers are up. We want to be protective. We want to use um, social distancing, wearing of a mask, washing our hands, using hand sanitizers, washing frequently touched surfaces. All those preventive measures are critically important for everyone to follow. We always remind everyone to take care of both your physical and your mental health. That means pay attention, follow all the guidance, make sure you get your regular uh, immunizations, and then you are also eating well, exercising, protecting both your physical and mental health, and making sure you're getting all those preventive screenings that are so critically important. So again, our offices are open for business. Our Burton location offers family planning, immunizations, sexually transmitted infection testing, and our WIC program. And we do all those services by appointment at the Burton location. So if you need anything, you can always call ahead and ask questions before you come. I want to remind everybody how critical it is that we follow these preventive measures. This is the only way that we will keep the numbers down and allow the economy to move forward. Thank you, Suzanne. I want you to stay right with me uh, because I, I want to remind our listeners, we would thank you for uh, putting your questions in. We have a great panel today that's behind the scenes, ready to answer questions for you. And we did have a question that resulted from some of the issues that our community is facing. So I want to read this question from one of our listeners, that uh, participants that sit in into the HFRCC website. It says, uh, if a person who works for a local hospital and has tested positive stays home with kids, but was told by their doctor, kids do not get need testing and they can go to school. So the children are attending in-person school. The person has been contacted by the health department regarding contact tracing. Positive test was reported uh, in October. The family is very upset that the children attending schools are attending schools are and the safety of are concerned about the safety of others. The person is not quarantined within the home. Question, is it safe for the children to be in school? Is it true that the children do not have to be tested? And if one of the parents tested positive and has not quarantined themselves within the house, you know, what, what challenge does that bring? Uh, so this is a question for, it was actually directed to Dr. Reynolds and Suzanne, uh, 
Uh, but please uh, feel free to open your mic and give us a response. Uh, I can start off. Number one, was the person positive? Okay. If that person in the house was positive, then the family needs to be tested and be in quarantine. Because if you have a question, you need to be in quarantine. And quarantine is 14 days. And if you're symptom free, you're probably good. But during that quarantine, if you have any signs or symptoms of COVID-19 infection, fever, chills, rapid breathing, cough, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, there's, there's a whole list of symptoms, uh, then if they have not been tested, they need to be tested and go into isolation. So, so oh, sorry, Dr. Reynolds, <laughs> keep going. Who, who's on the line there? It's Kim. 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 Take it over. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so um, just, just to back up a little bit, and I, my free screen froze, so I'm not sure um, exactly where Dr. Reynolds came in, but I think the biggest concern with that question is, is it okay for those kids to go to school if the parents or if someone else in the house household is quarantining and the yes. answer to that is yes um, it's it's almost always a first degree exposure so only the person who was exposed needs to be in quarantine they should try to quarantine as best they can within that household so that if they become symptomatic they haven't then exposed their family members some people will quarantine in the basement some people will quarantine in their bedroom um, if they have a separate bathroom that they can use. But yes, unless somebody inside the household becomes positive um, or symptomatic, then those kids can go ahead and attend school. So the reminder here for everyone is that the testing locations do test adults and they test children. So the testing is available for both adults and children as needed. Okay, so just to clarify, if the person in the home has a positive test, they must quarantine within the home. If they have a positive test, that means the children should also be tested. And so Kim, I just wanna just ask one more time, the positive test is in the home, should the children be quarantined as well? Yes, of the original question was, if the positive test was not in the home, the parents are quarantining, the child can go to the school. But if the, if the positive test is in the home, then the parent is isolating, the person who is ill is isolating, and the children who are questionable and have been exposed are quarantining. Okay. All right. So this may come up again because it's a challenging question, but I appreciate you answering that question because it also leads us then to encourage that we utilize these testing sites. And I want to bring Sharonda Grigsby on now, who is uh, the public health consultant at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And she's been very instrumental in helping us get these local testing sites set up. So Sharonda, can you take a couple minutes and just talk to us about your perspective of this and why it's important? Thank you, Yvonne, of course. Thanks for inviting me to give more information. I wanted to talk a little bit about the patient experience. I am a Flint community member and I had opportunity to, you know, see both sides to go in and get tested as a community member and work as a liaison between the three Flint community sites and the department um, and carrying back feedback on um, the patient experience at, when attending the site. And one of the big questions that always come up is about the patient experience and um, the process um, for receiving results once a community member goes to the neighborhood type test site and um, receives a test. Um, just a little bit on the patient experience, like um, Suzanne talked about, we the test sites do accept walk-ins but it is highly recommended that you um, schedule an appointment before attending the site to minimize your time uh, when attending the site whether you schedule a test or are walking you go through a short intake phase before actually um, taking the test um, 
uh, one of the big questions is what happens afterwards. I've gone to the test site, I've taken a test, um, what happens next? So I wanted to walk you guys a little bit through what happens post-test when you go in. Um, individuals should expect to receive their test results in three to four days. Um, and how that generally takes place um, when the community member is tested at the neighborhood test site, they'll be contacted by the Hanu Help Center by phone uh, within four days after the test, within three or four days after the test. Um, community members will also receive a text message informing that their results are ready um, and information on how they can access those test results. Um, they can be accessed by logging into the HANO portal um, to get the test results, and that portal is www.hanumg.info slash results or they can contact the Help Center for Results. Community members will need to give their name and date of birth uh, when contacting the Help Center to get those results, or they could email the, the COVID helpline um, at COVID19help at hanumg.com. And the number for the Help Center is 517-940-8811 or they can call the toll-free hotline at 877-878-7740. The Help Center will attempt to reach um, the individual up to three times to relay their test results. Those phone calls are generally made between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. daily. Um, it's important to know that um, no test results will be left in a voice message. Um, up to two more attempts after that initial call will be made to the individual to relay their test results. Um, and we have experienced that, you know, there has been issues, some um, issues with delaying test results, and we try our best um, to contact those individuals and relay that information if their test results will be delayed more than four days. Um, in addition to the testing that's available at the testing sites, I also wanted to highlight the navigation wraparound services that are available and, um, and what, those, what those services entail is that the individual will complete a brief um, intake form. That intake form is typically done when the person is um, collecting their specimen. It takes, you know, seven to eight minutes, up to eight, seven, eight minutes to collect the uh, specimen with the um, oral collection method. Um, so that's, you know, idle time that the individual has to take the, complete the intake survey. And what happens is that intake survey is collected by the Greater Flint Health Coalition who will make contact with that individual within 24 to 48 hours. Um, to connect and referral with referrals to identified services. And those services include, but are not limited to food, utilities, connection to a medical home, benefits assistance, and so much more. And I'll take questions. All right, Sharonda, thank you so much. And we're gonna ask our participants to put questions in the queue. Uh, one quick question uh, for the testing sites testing is, size. Uh, it, how old does a child have to be to get tested? With the testing sites, we they're testing from infants all the way up to late adults, seniors. Okay, all right, great, thank you. So again, let me thank Dr. Reynolds, Suzanne, and Kim for your insights along with Sharonda around the testing sites and those questions. We talked a little bit about vaccines. We're gonna utilize these last few minutes of our segment today to ask Dr. Susan Wolfer to, to share with us some insights about vaccines because we know that's a big issue. We've got the flu vaccines we're talking about. So we want to just make sure we include this segment for today, especially with the holiday season coming up. Dr. Wolford. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for this opportunity to speak a bit about vaccines and actually uh, to share a little bit about both COVID and, um, and the flu, because we will be dealing with both of those. Um, in this coming season. So I am going to uh, share my screen here um, and hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Give me a nod, Yvonne, if that's correct. Yes, All I right. can see COVID-19 so, flu. 
Yeah. There we go. Um, two main types of flu, right? There's influenza A and influenza B. And in those families, we have many strains. And that's important because it impacts how well vaccines work, because it isn't just one form of the virus that we're dealing with. Um, as you know, coronaviruses, there are many of those that we've had in the past, and now we have the novel coronavirus. So both viruses get into our um, body and have a um, preference for being in the respiratory system. The flu more in the upper, the um, coronavirus in the lower, but that's where they get, they hijack the cells and stop them from doing their work. We know that we get it by breathing it in from somebody else who had it or by touching something and then putting our hands to our face, our eyes, our nose and our mouth. Two important things about the, that are different between these viruses are how many people they will get, you'll get sick if you have it. So there's this number, R0, that tells you about how many people one person who has it would infect. So somebody with influenza might infect about 1.3 other people, whereas with COVID, we think they infect about 2 to 2.5 other people. You say, not a big difference. What's the big deal? Huge difference. If we look at somebody that are naught of 1.3, so for the flu, if we look at that from 10 rounds, one person infects 1.3 other people, those affect another set of people, and we do that 10 times over, guess how many people are infected? Pretty high. 56 other people from just that one person. Okay. Now, if we think about COVID-19, where the number at the lowest it could be is probably two, if we think of that person affecting two people and then those two people infecting two people, we do that 10 times over, guess how many people are affected in the end? Huge number. Over 2,000 people get infected. So that is why it is so important for us to think about how we can stop the spread. For flu, we have a vaccine. So why would we not use it? We absolutely want to use it. As you remember, our immune system has these different kinds of cells, one called phagocytes, um, that make me think of the drink phago, that come along, they see a virus, they engulf it, they eat it, kill it, and it can no longer impact the body. Okay, then we have antibodies, and antibodies are produced by cells, for a specific type of the virus. So they produce that antibody, it goes to that virus, draws those phagocytes in and kills them, kills the virus. And then we have a really cool system where the proteins from the outside of the virus, those little knobs on the outside of the virus are put on the surface of our cell this attracts our natural immune system cells in there to kill that virus and so again makes us better what vaccines do it's like a self-defense training camp for the body it teaches those virus that the body how to fight the virus gives them that training there's me doing my self-defense but <laughs> that is what it's doing for the immune system and so when it comes in contact with the actual virus in large amounts, it can fight it off. So we have vaccines that fight all of these childhood illnesses. So if you have kids, get them vaccinated. And I know um, Dr. Reynolds would say, and adults need to get their vaccines as well. Also, we have it for the flu, right? And, but people sometimes don't want to get the flu vaccine because they think it will make them sick. The flu vaccine will not make you sick. We do not use the live whole virus in making the vaccine. What are used, if you use the nasal spray vaccine, is a weakened virus that cannot make you sick. Also, in the shot, we have the killed virus. Again, it cannot make you sick. Or we take those small proteins from the outside, and that's what's used. Again, it all trains the system how to fight the virus, but it cannot make you sick. So everybody should get their flu virus who can get their flu virus so that we can protect. Flu vaccine, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, sorry, everybody should get the flu vaccine. <laughs> yes, that's right. Everybody should get the <sighs> flu vaccine who can get the flu vaccine so that we will not get the virus. Thank um, you, Dr. Dr. Susan. I'm going to ask you to hold this slide that you're about to give to us for next week. I will because hold Because we are one minute from our time <laughs> to end okay, today. Okay, we'll end with get the flu va vaccine. <laughs> yes, and there are numerous places where we can go to get the flu vaccine. Uh, if we get that last slide up, if we can share, get the screen back tape. Uh, Hamilton Community Health, Health Network has a number of opportunities for us. We have other community uh, sites that will be giving flu vaccines in the next few weeks at no cost to our community, no out-of-pocket cost. So we want you to remember that. We also want you to remember that you can register for the research symposium that's coming up that's sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. That research symposium will be November 20th. So we want you to register now. For those of you that will be nominating individuals for our awards, you have another day tomorrow, November 7th. Get those nominations in for, the, for that. And we also want to remind you, CEUs are available for this for community health workers. And we are working with a team to make sure we can see if it's available for our social workers as well. We wanna thank you today for tuning in for our webinar. Like us on Facebook, Facebook and as you can see, we're looking at our, our uh, website to make sure, our email to make sure we can answer questions that you may have. Call us at 810-835-2130. We'll be happy to answer those questions. And guess what? We'll be on week 35 next week, November 13th. We want you to come back and be with us and help us to learn more from you through that evaluation. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you again next week. Thank you to all of our panelists. Remember, we do everything we can to keep ourselves healthy and our community.